Welcome friends to the nicest show on the internet. And these aren't my words. These are the words of Bill Ackman, aka William, aka the third greatest investor of all time. So William, now that we're friends, this message goes out directly to you. Check your emails because I sent you my resume and please sell that Nike position. It's not going to work out, little bro. Hey, thanks. Bye. Welcome everybody to the daily recap show where we talk about stocks and the financial markets. My name is Chase. If you like this video, please subscribe, hit that notification bell as well as the like button and leave a comment for the algorithm. Let's get into it. This is the daily heat map of the S&P 500. And as you can see, a lot of red and not that much green. So let's talk about the green first. We had energy, the best performing sector. That's because of what happened with energy prices. They really have been a great hedge during these red days. Eli Lilly was the, a solid green contender in healthcare along with Pfizer after an activist took a stake looking to make changes in their business. PayPal was up 0.75% and Nvidia was up 2.55% respectively when the broader market was very red, including the mega cap names. Microsoft, Apple in tech were red, Google and Meta in comp services, Amazon, Tesla were red in the discretionary space. Utilities were a dumpster fire. Everything was very, very red. A very ugly day across the board. Energy, the best performing sector up 0.4%, but still a very muted day. Utilities, the worst performing sector down 2.3%, discretionary down 1.7%, com services 1.4%, financials 1.3%. Absolutely crazy movement right here. R horrendous movement if you ask me. The second best performing sector was materials down 0.4%. So guys, brutal day in the large cap space, especially if you were concentrated in cyclicals. Very red day for your portfolio across the board. Large cap, small cap, mid caps, but mid caps relatively outperformed if you ask me so too did small caps except small cap growth but value call as well as mid cap growth value call fed fairly well against the broader large cap indices but at this point we're grasping at straws because it was red across the board it was an ugly day for the entire market and it had to do with yields yields rose today yields rose significantly on friday and the 10-year yield sitting at four percent just four weeks ago the 10-year yield was at 3.6 percent and that tells you everything you need to know the 30 a yield at 4.3%. And when you have treasuries paying above 4%, the markets are naturally going to rotate from equities, which some people deem to be very overvalued at the moment, and into stuff like bonds. They're going to collect that yield. And if the Fed does cut rates into 2024, 25, they're going to get that upside momentum that would come from a lower Fed funds. And this type of price action weighed on equities, especially in US equities. Now, there's always context behind these big moves. Yields are rising on the fact that the economy is significantly better than we thought. You see the Fed raise rates to soften the economy to temper inflation. Now they're actually cutting rates to stop the economic deterioration. But the truth is the economy isn't deteriorating. We had a couple of months of bad data, but the data is now very, very Goldilocks. And now the and now yields are rallying on the back of that, pretty much signaling to the Fed, hey, you don't need to cut as much. The economy is in good shape. And that is why yields are rallying, having the effect they are having on stocks at the moment. Equities across the board fell. The S&P 500 and NASDAQ 100 fell 0.96 and 1.17% respectively. A brutal day. We did see outperformance in small caps, mid caps, as well as the broad market RSP. And we're seeing a little bit of upbeat action here in the after hours, but inconsequential, really. We saw volatility rear its head up nearly 18% today at the 22 mark. And that does tend to happen in the month of October, especially in an election year and expect more of the same as we approach the election. And this is what caused the trouble here today for the markets. It had to do with the yields. The two-year yield was up 1.66%. It was up 5% on Friday, approaching the 4% mark. The 10-year yield gained today, the 30-year yield gained today, and then bonds fell as a result. And when you look at the TLT at 94 at the moment, it was 102 just a couple of weeks ago. You see relatively strong risk to reward. You buy the TLT, you get a 4.1, 4.2% yield, and you diversify into a bond. It's risk-free, essentially. It's guaranteed. And then you do have relative upward momentum if the Fed does cut rates. And that's what really weighed on stocks. Investors are looking at the risk to reward they can get in bonds versus stocks and seeing, hey, with a 4% yield, treasuries look attractive. 
And that's why we saw buying in TLT. DXY, the dollar was flat here today, but seeing at the 102 area, pretty much at 100 at the start of last week. So we saw a huge up move in the dollar. If we just pull up the chart, you can see that you know we had a massive move from these lows right here, broke some of these critical levels. And now I expect the dollar to pull back, consolidate at this line where we made these resistance zones right here, and then either shoot back up, continue to the 103, 104 level or break below to the 100 level. It's really going to depend on what the economic data looks like when we do pull back. So I do see a little bit of weakness in the dollar to this 102 area, and then we're going to make the next big move to the upside or downside, and we'll tackle it when we get there. Commodities were all right today. Gold was down 0.4%. Silver was down 1.56%, but crude gained nearly 4%. And to actually see the energy sector gain 0.34% today in the context of crude oil while ripping 4% to the upside really goes to show the momentum, especially bearish momentum we saw in equities. On any other given day, crude oil would be up like 1% to 2% easily when crude numbers are that high because energy is highly reactive to the price of oil. But let's dive into the S&P 500 and we see some very interesting things. Firstly, we're officially in negative gamma in the S&P 500. That means we now sell into weakness, buy into strength, and our downside targets are the 56.50 area. If this does move down to the 5600 area that would be our next downside target but the put support is now our target if we do gap up tomorrow into this positive gamma area because we are looking a little bit positive here in the after hours then we'd be back in negative gamma and we buy dip sell rips to the core resistance but we need to see if that's actually going to move down if that does move down that is normally a bearish indicator and as it is right now we eye negative gamma that means we do have to look to the 5650 area into the rest of this week things looking a little bit more positive for the NASDAQ 100 still in positive gamma we found a little bit of support at the gamma flip zone but there's our targets for the core resistance we put support we are in positive gamma at the moment so that means we buy dips sell rips to the 20,400 area but if we do dip below the gamma flip that's the target but I remain constructively bullish on the NASDAQ 100 because this looks really really constructive yes we didn't go ahead and hit that all-time high but we put in a low a higher low a high a higher high all we need to do now is hold this level right here and if we do pull down even if we break the put support as long as we stay above this level it would just signal trend continuation if we go ahead break this high and then we can go target new all-time highs so very constructive price action in the nasdaq 100 as well as the rty the russell 2000 very very similar although looking significantly stronger on the charts look at this week we got here the russell 2000 outperformed large caps was on equal footing with mid caps today and we saw a lot of buying if we actually go into the one minute chart look at the daily right this is the price action we saw on the day we saw relentless selling all the way down significant buying right at the end of the day here in the russell 2000 we didn't see that in the s p 500 and we didn't see that in the nasdaq 100 it was really just the rty where we saw a huge impulse move from the lows of the day and forming an equal high going to show the relative strength in small caps now let's go back on the daily chart and we could see yes we are still in positive gamma but we did actually pretty much go touch the gamma flip zone so that is cause for concern because if we do break below then we would target the 2150 area but relative strength and this still now is looking like a, a higher low relative to this low right here and like the nasdaq 100 a higher low at this point would just mean trend continuation if we go ahead and break these highs and these 52 week highs so the Russell 2000 you know hanging in there despite the movement we saw in rates and that's really really telling because let's say we get like one bad print rates fall significantly yes equities might fall as well but on the back of those easier rates you know the russell 2000 might actually just rip to the upside because small cap stocks aren't really correlated to the economy per se they're more correlated to what's actually happening with yields and the cost of capital diving into the rsp i really do like the rsp i think you want to be buyers here at the 176 i think let's say you have like spare money in your account split it into like two different sections and you buy here at the 176 and if we keep moving down in the rsp RSP, you buy at the 172. I think regardless, we find support here and then move up in the RSP. I'm very bullish on the equal weight into next year. I think we're going to go hit the 200 level. It's at 177 right now. And if you buy at 172, the risk to reward right there is relatively great. I think we're going to see strong, strong year in the RSP in 2025, even to the end of the year. But guys, this is all just an opportunity to buy the dip. I do want equities to move lower so I can load up. I do believe that an end of year rally is coming and I'd love to get in at lower levels and for the rsp that's the 172 
52 level for the RTY. That's at the 2150 area for the NASDAQ 100. That would be this 19,250 area, but you know, even lower would be better. And for the S&P 500, that area would be the 5650 area. The lower, the better, because I do think we are going to move higher into the end of the year. I think we're just in a very volatile October period, and we also just have to contend with an election. So guys, don't fear. Things aren't falling apart. Yields are rising because the economy is great. You want to be biased for equities on this weakness. Diving into seasonality, this is S&P 500 returns when we've had a January to September that is greater than 10%. So generally speaking, the first three quarters of the year, positive. What can we expect in the months thereafter? Now in 2024, we returned 20.81% in this time period, January to September. And normally we can see the October to December period, Q4, return 2.83%. Median return significantly better, 3.29%. But if you break it down even further, we tend to see volatility in the early part of October. As you can see, October 7th to 15th, one week, which is this coming week, we normally see negative 2.15% average returns. However, from October 27th to December 31st, so pretty much about a nine week period, we see 6% in gains in the S&P 500. And this has to do with a whole bunch of stuff. It has to do with collateral reinvestment. It also has to do with the fact that there is significantly less trading days in this fourth quarter period because of stuff like Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's. There's also the major options expiring months. A lot of the leaps expire in December and all of that hedging, all of that collateral reinvestment needs to be put back into the market. And that happens with significantly less days of trading. In this fourth quarter, we have the least trading days available. And that's why we tend to see a rally in the fourth quarter. It's simple supply and demand. If we had to pop this onto a chart, this is what it looks like. This blue line is what we've done so far in the second half of 2024. This dotted line is the average return path. And then we have the one standard deviation or the 80th and 20th percentile ranges. And you can see that volatility is actually being contained with inside a standard deviation. And normally what happens in the second half of the year, we actually normally trade flat to slightly up. We normally then put a bottom sort of around the October, mid to late October. October, and then we go on this November and December Santa rally. So guys, any volatility we do get in this October period, we do want to take advantage of that by the dip because returns into Q4 tend to be very, very strong. But ultimately, we need to pay attention to the fundamentals. And we are officially in the third quarter earnings season. The big banks report this week, along with Pepsi and a couple of other key names. And expectations aren't that high. We're looking at revenue growth of 4%, earnings growth of 5% and margins of 12.1%. We'll see if we beat these expectations. The best performing sector on an earnings standpoint is looking like it's going to be technology with 15.1% earnings growth. They also have double digit revenue growth, then financials in second place on the earnings front, as well as healthcare. We see materials, the worst performing sector, seeing negative 4% in revenue and negative 21.7% in earnings. So a brutal earnings season is expected here for materials. Materials. By the way, this is blended earnings growth. Now, these figures right here is actually going to make for a great comp next year or sequentially in the fourth quarter. And part of the reason actually has to do with revisions. Going into this quarter, we saw massive changes in third quarter earnings. The S&P 500 saw a negative 3.9% revision into this quarter. Every sector saw a revision except for comp services, which was flat, and information technology, which saw a up revision of 0.3%. Energy and materials raised revisions to the downside. This has to do with just energy prices, commodity prices, as well as the dollar, and then industrials, negative 8.5% revision. Healthcare saw earnings revised down utilities, and that's what the total market saw in earnings revisions. But this is just for Q3. Looking 12 months out, things look very robust. Next 12 months earnings per share at an all-time high, sitting at $267. Very, very strong. Forward expectations continue to move up, and you want to hold equities when earnings are growing. And here are the return drivers so far for 2024. We can see that the S&P 500 has returned about 21% so far this year. 10% of it has actually been multiple.
multiple growth. 11% of it has actually been earnings growth. A very interesting, very healthy market momentum. So despite everything we've seen in the market, gains have actually been split between multiple expansion as well as earnings growth. Looking at it from 2020 to 2024, we see a much different picture. We actually see 57% of gains has actually come from earnings growth, 21% from multiple growth, 14% from dividend growth. And then total return from 2020 to 2024 is 92% in the S&P 500. So very strong returns. Yes, some people will say multiple driven growth at this point is a bit high, but in aggregate, when you look at it over the last four and a half, five years, very strong. This doesn't scream like a bubble to me. Profit growth has been strong, and that's really been the major driver of returns in the last four years, as well as this year. And talking about return drivers, Goldman updated the S&P 500 price targets, and this is what they had to say. I'm going to read it for you. Ahead of the third quarter 2024 earnings season, Goldman Sachs, we raise our 2025 S&P 500 EPS forecast to $268. That's 11% year over year from 256% and introduced 2026 EPS estimate of $288, 7% year over year growth. We maintain our long held full year 2024 EPS forecast of $241. Our revised estimates are above the 2025 and 2026 top down strategist consensus estimates. We assume the market capitalizes earnings of 274 and 25 and 326, representing negative revisions to bottom up analyst consensus expectations. So today's PE multiple of 22X is in line with our macro model of fair value. We forecast the PE will be unchanged at year end 2024, and we lift our index target to 6,000 from 5,600 and our 12 month target to 6,300 from 6,000, implying 4% and 10% upside respectively. So there you go, guys. Goldman see a rally into the year end to the 6,000 level and 6,300 next 12 months, in large part driven by the same amount of earnings growth for EPS estimates into 2025, 2026. And looking at the macro, guys, today we're going to be taking a look at the broad economy, look, taking a glance at everything just to see where we stand. The Fed's GDP now sitting at 2.5% right here. Growth looks good so far. Solid economic expansion. The labor market also looking really tight. Payroll growth over the last three months has averaged 186,000. By the way, the 2019 average was 166,000. So this is above the 2019 average, the pre-COVID average. Average. And sure, guys, this could be revised down, but it's still likely to be okay. And for the record, we actually saw slight up revisions in the last two months. At the same time, looking at construction employment, it's at all time highs. This is quite literally one of the best parameters for the economy. This is a new all time highs. Construction workers are employed. This is a huge part of the economy. It's at all time highs. This is not bearish at all. At the same time, inflation continues to moderate. PCE continues to towards the Fed's target. And to be honest, this is Goldilocks. We're seeing full employment, disinflation, robust economic expansion. This is Goldilocks data to me. And with regards to jobs and growth, over the last three months, wage growth has run at an annualized pace of 4.3%, which is solid. And if you combine wage growth with employment growth and hours worked, we get a sense of aggregate income growth across all workers in the economy. This is what this chart shows us. And right now it's running at a three month annualized pace of 4.4%. And if you're wondering why economic growth keeps exceeding a lot of people's expectations, especially after recent upward revisions, this is why income growth right now is powering the economy as opposed to credit. At the same time, every income quartile is less levered now than they were in 2020, 2018, as well as 2008. And then guys, looking at data and earnings tomorrow, we have Pepsi before the bell on Tuesday. That's really it. Nothing really on Wednesday. Thursday, we have Delta and Domino's parameters for the consumer. Then Friday, we got some of the big banks, JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, BlackRock, BNY Mellon. Earnings season for Q3 officially kicks off this week. I'm so excited. Cannot wait for the next couple of weeks, especially for some of the stocks I hold in my portfolio.